Hi, I'm uh, Jun Choi. Um, um, in Earth and Atmospheric Science at Georgia Tech. I just came to Korea to start a new postdoc position in Kyost. Today I'm going to talk about uh, dispersion statistics in Lake Michigan and the Gulf of Mexico. There's no relevance between the Lake Michigan and the Gulf of Mexico. I put those two different environments in this talk because those areas were my the study area in my PhD and my um, so I want to share with you about the dispersion study in those area. So motivation. So the ultimate goal of this dispersion study is to provide a useful information to the decision makers when an oil spill like accident happen. So when it happened, they may have following questions, such as where will it go and where, or how fast will it go and how fast will it spread and what kind of physics will be linked to it. So, um, so this figure is the oil location when uh, BP oil spill happened in 2010. So first figure shows the oil location in first months, and this is shows the oil uh, location in second months. So in first months, uh, the, those kind of uh, oil attacked in Louisiana area, and second months, this oil attacked in nor northern um, Florida. So if the decision maker know about the information about the well, this. Uh, oil gold and how fast it will reach to those areas, it will be great for them to prepare some strategy to prevent, prevent some damage caused by this oil spill. So this is our line. So first, I'm going to introduce some uh, quantification method for vertical mixing and horizontal dispersion, and uh, followed by the uh, physical processes in Lake Michigan and the Gulf of Mexico. They may associate with the uh, uh, dispersion statistics. And followed by dispersion statistics in Lake Michigan and the Gulf of Mexico. And finally, I'm going to introduce a satellite application for real-time contaminant monitoring and short-term forecasting using Lagrangian coherent structure. So last two part is kind of the future work for me. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, I'm going to do this work in Kyost. So uh, let's talk about uh, vertical mixing parameterization. So we can calculate vertical diffusivity KG from the dye experiment, such as Rodamin WT or SF6 or scalar simulation. So you need a two profile. Uh, like an initial uh, concentration profile in vertical, vertical direction and final um, uh, concentration profile. So you can easily calculate the uh, vertical diffusivity using this um, equation. And also if you have, uh, if you run the simulation, like a scalar simulation, you can have three-dimensional uh, concentration. So you can calculate the variance using the second moment of the concentration um, 3D concentration, and then you can easily calculate the vertical diffusivity. Now let's talk about the um, uh, horizontal dispersion. So most popular way is to use the relative dispersion. So it measures the separation distance R with so it's defined by the mean square of separation distance R in all pairs. And after we get the R square, we can calculate the horizontal diffusivity using this um, equation. So from those two equations, we can uh, get uh, two graphs. One shows the relationship between R square versus time, and the other shows the relationship between K versus R. So if, so we can get the feeding parameter, feeding exponent and M and N. So if M is equal to one, we said that we, we can say this is diffusion and corresponding component 
uh, exponent n is 0. And if m is equal to 2, we, said, uh, we say this is ballistic dispersion. If m is 3, this, uh, we can say this is uh, um, this dispersion is associated with the recharging dispersion or shear dispersion. So corresponding uh, exponent here is four third. So this is shows also recharging dispersion. But uh, this relative dispersion is challenged and criticized because it does not, sh it cannot show the effect of certain size of eddy or a certain um, process of certain length scale because it's defined by the um, mean scale average of r. So some pair can have small r, and some pair may have big r. So it's kind of averaging, average of all kinds of the eddy size. So it's hard to show the effect of certain um, size of eddy. So in order to recover, um, overcome that, we use finite size Lyapunov of exponent. So it measures, it takes from um, separation distance delta to separation distance 1.2 delta. So using this equation, we can calculate the FSLE and the separation distance delta. And we can calculate the feeding parameter m. If m is uh, minus 2, it, uh, sh um, is it uh, associated with diffusion. If it is minus 1, uh, it is um, sh it associated with shear dispersion. If the exponent is minus 2 over 3, um, we said the dispersion is recharging dispersion. And uh, if the some scale process are strong, we get the uh, minus 1 over 2. And if exponent this exponent is zero. Uh, we can say the dispersion is associated with the exponential dispersion. So in the previous two slides, uh, I talked about the um, quantification of particle dispersion. This slide talk about uh, quantification of scalar dispersion. So the variance ij square can be calculated from uh, variance uh, uh, sigma i and sigma j, which are the standard deviation of the concentration in major and minor direction. And sigma i and sigma j can, uh, can be calculated from the eigenvalidic composition using uh, covariant matrix. And finally, we can calculate the horizontal diffusivity. So this is an example of the, um, the standard deviation uh, in major and minor direction in real um, dye concentration map. So let's talk more about the horizontal diffusivity. So as time goes, the dye patch um, increases. Uh, the size of dye patch increases. Also, the, the size of the uh, drifter cluster increases. So if, if we plot, the relationship between the sigma square variance versus time. Actually, the this slope is uh, this person coefficient k. So the if the exponent is one, we can say this is a normal diffusion, and if the exponent is less than one, we can say this is sub diffusion. If this exponent is larger than one, uh, it is a super diffusion. And super diffusion and sub diffusion are the anomalous diffusion. So the normal diffusion is corresponding to the um, scale independent constant k because this k uh, is, does not change with the size of um, the die patch or size of the drifter cluster. But if you see the uh, super diffusion, uh, k is scale dependent. That means dispersion coefficient k increases with the size of eddy, uh, size of the cl uh, drifter cluster or size of the die patch. If the exponent is three here 
and four third here we we can say this is Richardson dispersion. So Richardson dispersion is found by Richardson in 1926. He was a, a meteorologist, so he had a lot of chance to observe the sky and air. He observed the volcanic ash and some cyclone in uh, in the sky, and also he observed the balloons uh, in the air. And he calculated horizontal diffusivity and cluster size from uh, this phenomenon. Then he plot the relationship between the dispersion coefficient k and l. And he found the exponent 4 third. This is a, a Richardson dispersion. And later time, this Richardson dispersion is found uh, in the ocean by Okubo in 1971. This also shows a Richardson dispersion. So Richardson dispersion does not happen always. It happens when the die patch, size of die patch or size of drifter cluster is comparable to the size of eddy in inertial subrange. Uh, where the slope is minus uh, 5 third in kinetic energy spectra. So this is Richardson dispersion. So when the die patch, the size of die patch is uh, comparable to the dissipation scale, then is, it, it shows a diffusion, so the exponent is 1. If the size of die patch is larger than the integral scale, it becomes uh, the diffusive behavior again. So let's talk about the physical processes in Lake Michigan uh, and the Gulf of Mexico. I will show you only the, some important uh, physical process that can be related to the dispersion statistic. So this is uh, um, one physical process in Lake Michigan. It can be found in, uh, in the summertime in the center of lake. So this is actually the measurement. This is top surface and this is the lake bottom. So this near inertia internal waves uh, is a, is a shows clockwise rotating with a near inertia period of 17.5 hours. And it has a strong shear near surface and the thermocline. And this measurement was made at this location, at the center of Southern Basin. And this is important physical process in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is a, a summer scale processes. Uh, that size, uh, the time scale is order of one day and horizontal length scale is order of one kilometer. And vertical length scale is order of 100 meter. So this is a kind of example of summer scale processes. So strength of summer scale processes has a seasonal dependence. So during the uh, winter time, the uh, uh, mixed-layer thickness is maximized. So the summer scale process uh, become maximized. And uh, if the river enforcing is strong, uh, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, there is uh, some freshwater influx from the Mississippi River that increase the gradient, uh, density gradient, and that result in some instability at the surface that result in the uh, strong summer scale processes. So I'm going to show you some uh, dispersion statistics uh, in the Lake Michigan and the Gulf of Mexico using some field experiment and some numerical result. So this slide shows the, um, I'm going to use six surface drifter and uh, 11 kilometer of rhodamine dye released at the surface at the same time at the center of the Southern Lake Michigan. So at that time, there was a strong near inertia wave. Uh, we observed that, and then the wind was almost zero. And we tracked the drifters and the dye patch for one day. So this is almost a uh, start of the drifter and dye patch. And we tracked almost one day. So gray bar shows the size of drifter cluster. 
and black bar shows the size of dye patch. And this is dye, and this small circle indicate drifters. So from this figure, you, you can easily recognize there's a big difference between the drifter dispersion and dye dispersion for one day. So using those data, we can plot some, um, some dispersion uh, plot, variance versus time. So black line shows the dye dispersion, and the red line shows the drifter dispersion. So if you calculate dispersion coefficient k, dye has almost five meters square per second, and drifter shows 0 0.1 meters square per second. So dye dispersion is 50 times faster than drifter dispersion in one day. And this can be explained by the shear, vertical strong vertical shear induced by near inertia internal wave. For drifter, they remain at the surface, so they cannot feel the vertical shear induced by near inertia internal wave. But die, they go to, uh, down downward, say, so they can easily feel the vertical shear induced by near inertia internal wave. That can explain um, those the difference between die dispersion and drifter dispersion. And in this slide, I'm going to compare the drifter in Lake Michigan and drifter in Gulf of Mexico. So left panel shows the uh, drifter dispersion in Lake Michigan. So we used the six drifters and we released them at the center of Lake Michigan. Because of the strong near inertia wave, they just uh, make a circle and um, make uh, some oscillation. And as they approach to the near shore, the near inertia effect is uh, weakened. And right panel shows the uh, drifters in the Gulf of Mexico. We released 90 drifters. Uh, almost same time, like July uh, 2012. And uh, we released them uh, at the same location where the deep water horizon oil spill happened in 2010. So in this time period, we also found a strong near inertia wave. And we also uh, found very strong somatosphere processes. So this, the blue green line shows the trajectory of one drifters, and I uh, made, make out the red dot every day. So using those graph, uh, using those data, I'm going to show you the dispersion statistic. So the black line shows the uh, Gulf of Mexico drifter, and the red line shows the uh, Lake Michigan drifters. So left panel shows the uh, variance versus time, and right panel shows the dispersion coefficients k versus um, cluster size. So the point is there's a big difference between the dispersion in Lake Michigan and the Gulf of Mexico. So we, uh, in both environments, we found very strong near inertia uh, waves but we found very strong uh, somatic scale processes in the Gulf of Mexico. So we, uh, so we in, in order to explain this gap, we can use these somatic scale processes that make um, the dispersion in the Gulf of Mexico very um, active. And this slide shows the scalar dispersion in the Gulf of Mexico. So we released a dye at the uh, same location uh, of BP oil spill at 1,000 meter depths. So we uh, tried many different uh, schemes, like um, different horizontal layer resolution and different vertical uh, number layer, and vertic different vertical mixing scheme and different advection scheme. So um, we want to find a better configuration that can result in the uh, 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 more realistic uh, the dispersion coefficient. That's why we did a lot of the um, that we tried a lot of cases.
So we release a die from here, the location of BP oil spill, at 1,000 meter depths. So let's look at uh, horizontal dispersion. This is the uh, vertically integrated dye concentration at four months after release. So uh, generally, as we increase the uh, horizontal resolution, and also as we increase the vertical resolution, the vertical uh, horizontal diffusivity decreases. And uh, even though we uh, release a dye at 1,000 meter depths, it roughly follow the Richardson dispersion for all cases. And now uh, let's look at the vertical mixing. So this is, uh, shows the same story. If we increase the vertical resolution and also if we increase the horizontal resolution, the uh, vertical diffusivity kg uh, decreases. So some lesson from these simulations. Um, we found so the choice of vertical mixing scheme is insensitive to the kg. So we tried uh, Melo Yamada 2.5, and we also tried the KPP uh, vertical mixing scheme, but the, we got the almost same kg. And the choice of trace, tracer advection scheme matters. We tried two advection schemes. One is MP data, and the other is um, split up the advection scheme. But there are a big difference uh, between uh, in the uh, vertical uh, diffusivity. So if, if we use the um, uh, advection scheme of the split up, we got much less uh, diffusivity. So the choice of, uh, choice of tracer advection scheme is really important. And as we increase the number of vertical layer and the horizontal resolution, that strongly affect the vertical distrib distribution of um, tracer. So that result resulting in smaller uh, vertical diffusivity. But the, the, the vertical diffusivity from the old simulation is still very larger, like order of magnitude, larger than observation. So the, this result at least show us uh, what's the better uh, configuration to get a realistic um, the vertical diffusivity, I mean, the, the close to the real value. So this slide shows the uh, relative dispersion uh, using the simulated particle in the northern Gulf of Mexico in uh, summer and uh, winter time. So this uh, red line shows the summer and this blue line shows the uh, winter. And there are three different initial separation distance, two, six, 30. And one point is um, stronger relative dispersion found in the winter time. That means uh, we have more wind in the winter time and we have more stronger sonometric process in the winter time. So that may cause a stronger relative dispersion. And the other thing to notice is as we increase the rel uh, initial separation distance, uh, it takes shorter time to reach diffusive stage. So for example, if we use the uh, in initial separation distance two kilometer, uh, it can be easily associated with uh, some eddy in the inertial subrange. That's why we, we see the, uh, the slope minus three for if we use the separation distance two kilometer. But if we use a larger separation distance like the 30, uh, it take a uh, shorter time to reach a uh, deep region because uh, this 30 kilometer may be larger than the eddy in the inertial subrange. So that's why it's uh, easily uh, associated with the eddy larger than um, the inertial subrange. That's why it's, uh, um, it reaches the deep region very fast. Uh, this shows the finite side Lyapunov exponent for the summer and the uh, uh, winter time. So the uh, red is February and the blue is August. And the solid line shows the FSLA without any uh, uh, subgrid parameterization or diffusion. 
So the uh, one point I, uh, is stronger FSLE found in the winter time. That means it takes shorter time for the particle to be separated in, in the winter time. And the other point is this blue line is actually the observation from field work. And there is a, a very uh, big gap between the observation and simulation. So we try to add some, some um, subgrid parameterization, like uh, adding diffusion here. So we got the, um, I think it's better than um, this line, but uh, it reached to the slope of minus one, which means that corresponds to the shear flow dispersion. But, ac but actually the uh, observation uh, that shows minus two third that is Richardson dispersion. So it seems like we need a better um, subgrid parameterization. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot to uh, improve our uh, simulation. So uh, I'm going to show you the cell I application for real-time contaminant monitoring and short-term forecasting using Lagrangian coherent structure. So cell light is a really powerful tool to detect um, the biological and anthropogenic um, contaminants. So in left uh, plot, uh, it is a uh, red tide captured by the uh, cell light. And right plot shows the oil spill. It, uh, it is a uh, Taeyang Peninsula. Uh, it's oil spill occurred in 2007. And this is uh, uh, the image captured by satellite uh, when the BP oil spill happened in 2010. And this is a uh, sargassum captured by the satellite. Uh, so one month ago, like uh, 15 days ago. So satellite is a really powerful tool to detect uh, uh, contaminants and uh, monitor uh, the contaminant. And uh, eventually, we want to prevent uh, some damage from this kind of contaminants. So that's why we want to use cell light information. So this is a schematic uh, kind of shows how we use cell light information to uh, predict uh, contaminant movement. So we can have some sea surface temperature and sea surface uh, salinity information from the cell light. Also, we can get the sea surface from cell light. And we, uh, we put those kind of data into the ocean modeling uh, through the data simulation to get better uh, result. And we can provide those oil area information to the pollution modeling. And this, the, um, the information got from the cell light can be an initial condition for the uh, pollution modeling. So after we perform the parameterization, like wind parameterization, turbulent parameterization, and after we consider the pollution property, we can get um, accurate pollution per forecast. So one example of pollution modeling is using Lagrangian coherent structure. So this plot shows the, some article uh, captured from the New York Times in 2009. The title of article is A Moving Boundary. So Lagrangian coherent structure partitions the flow field into the regions uh, that have same uh, fate and same um, dispersion rate. For example, if particle is dropped here, so the particle dropped here have the same fate. Or if particle is dropped here, uh, the particle dropped in this area have the same fate, same dispersion rate. So for example, uh, there's a no uh, material transport between um, this region and this region. So this kind of uh, is an invisible barrier. So this kind of map can be calculated from the finite size Lyapunov exponent or finite time Lyapunov exponent. So uh, this kind of the map is uh, important because 
when the oil spill happens, we can easily um, the predict where the particle goes, where the oil goes. So for example, if the oil is dropped here, this oil may reach this um, beach uh, in, in, in soon. Or if the oil reach, uh, dropped here, it can reach this uh, beach um, in, in a short time. So this kind of the method can be used to predict the movement of the contaminants. So this was outline. And I can mainly uh, divide this outline into two parts. So first, three parts, like a quantification of vertical mixing and the horizontal dispersion, and physical process and dispersion statistic. It's kind of effort to answer the, those two questions. How fast will it spread? And what kind of physics will be link linked to it? So this kind of things is a scientific question. So, but. I mean, the, the, the decision maker does not want to know about physical process and some kind of the uh, spreading rate. This is the kind of the uh, question uh, our scientists have. And the other two part is the uh, answer, uh, uh, try is the answer from the discussion the decision maker can have. But uh, we need uh, some balance study. I mean, for example, in order to get the uh, right the output of simulation, we, we need to validate our model. So we need to know about the, the mixing coefficient from the observation. That's why we need this kind of things to make the simulation right. Also, in order to parameterization right, we need to understand the physical process. So. These kind of things uh, should be balanced in order to the make uh, accurate the prediction of contaminants. So this is all I have.